Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 45, The Battle of Waterloo, with the special guest and Waterloo tour guide, Marcus Cribb. We are very excited today because it is June 17th, the day before the Battle of Waterloo anniversary, and we have joining us our good friend Marcus Cribb once again, so generous with his time. Hello, Marcus. Hello again. Thank you very much for having me back. You have such a great intro voice. It's fantastic. So I, uh, I appreciate you doing this, and um, tell us what you're going to be doing tomorrow at the battlefield. Yes, yeah, so uh, tomorrow, 18th of June, uh, 2023, uh, on the anniversary, I thought it'd be fantastic to get out to the battlefield. I've been out there quite a few times now, but never on the anniversary. So uh, I will be walking the battlefield with a group. Uh, at the time of recording, it's quite quite well booked. Uh, so I, I limited the places to, I think, to 20. So there only might be a few places left, but Okay. It's really just about getting out into the battlefield, seeing the this time in the time it happened, and uh, you know, obviously, we're paying respects to all those involved. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. And um, for those interested in more uh, exploits of Marcus, you can go to dukeofwellington.org. He has another tour coming up in September in Portugal and Spain. Correct? Yes, another one uh, over there uh, with classic battlefield tours and, uh, historian Dan Hill. And we are going to so many battles, uh, there from the sieges of Badajoz and Ciudad Rodrigo, Porto, Lines mm. of Torres Vedras. Yeah, we're squeezing a lot, but not too much in, um, basically. And I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah. So please do, yeah, have a check that out or as always come, come and find me on Twitter. Yeah. I'm still uh, working on getting to that one. I, I may join you on that. I'd one. love to have you there. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Uh, so I thought today, um, shifting to something different, because I've never done this, um, uh, we're going to focus on a, an individual battle, the Battle of Waterloo, since it's the anniversary. And Marcus and I thought we'd do 10 myths or legends about Waterloo that we'd like to dispel or at least discuss. And hopefully my listeners enjoy it. Excellent. Yeah, this is good. Obviously, you came from doing all the marshals and generals, and now uh, we're look, we are looking at the battles. It's Napoleon and dot, dot, dot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, I guess my, you know, most people know the story of Waterloo, you know, it was Napoleon's uh, last battle that he commanded himself. It was obviously a loss for Napoleon and he had had abdicated a second time. What is so intriguing about this battle, Marcus? Why do people fixate on it? Uh, You've got a few factors. One is undeniable. It is Napoleon. Uh, You know, he, he is one of the big names in history. But also he is facing off against the Duke of Wellington. Uh, the two men never met. Uh, this is the closest they get to fighting a battle. Uh, these are, you know, two of probably the most recognisable names or faces in history uh, facing off in one of the big battles that really then shapes the world until about the outbreak of the First World War. It draws the map of Europe. Uh, apart from the like, really the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany wars, uh, but it, that actually sets some of that in motion as well. It, it's it's a blockbuster event, and it really is one of the bookmarks in history that would have changed quite a bit, maybe. Possibly. Yeah, we'll go into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was talking to Luke Reynolds about it in mm. a, a, a podcast. He just said it's just a nice, tidy battle to wrap everything up because it has. Three great captains of the age, Blücher, Wellington, and Napoleon all going at it. Marshal Ney is there. And it's just such a final ending to such an epic, you know, era, don't you think? It's actually like the epilogue. It's the postscript. So there's lots of different ways of coming at this one, but it's undeniably one of the most fascinating uh, moments. And it's also got the most uh, what-ifs on history as well. Right. will fascinate us forever. Right. Let's let's start dissecting some of those. We have 10 that I've come up with and Marcus is going to help me discuss them. I'll, I'll add my input as well. But um, I guess number one that I that has always been a, a bone of contention with me, you know, as great as the victory that it is for England, the British would have won Waterloo with or without the Prussians. I, I, I say they would not have. Um, I don't think the Prussians get enough credit. But what, yeah. what, is your, what is your theory on that method? They would have won with or without the Prussians? Well, straight off, I'll say no. 
they would not have won without the Prussians mm -hmm. because they wouldn't have fought without the Prussians. Mm. So uh, I think that's the most important thing that is uh, forgotten. Sometimes people wave this and they do kind of like sports match analogies, you know, Eng England fighting France and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's not football, it's not cricket. Right. Uh, it's far more complicated. And the alliance is really important. Uh, Kwatibra, Lingi, Wav are not just kind of separate battles. They're really integral into the campaign. Wellington wouldn't have fought Waterloo uh, without the Prussians because of the decision, the actions in the battles on the 16th of June and the decisions made on the 17th of June. Right. So I think that's really important that Wellington would not have gone there and fought the battle at all if it wasn't for the Prussians. He would, they would not have been his plan. He probably would have retreated northwest uh, towards the coast. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned Ligny the, uh, two days before, um, you know, the Prussians had a, a stiff battle with the French, but they lost. But, you know, uh, Blucher, uh, you know, told Wellington he would be there. He, he would not leave his ally in the lurch. And I think that's, like you just mentioned, they, it, that's why Wellington decided to put his foot in the ground and hold that line. Yes. Uh, Wellington said before Lingy he would come to Blucher's aid if he was able to. Now, he wasn't able to because he had to fight uh, Ney at mm -hmm. Cap Bra. Mm -hmm. And that's still debated. You know, did Wellington let uh, Blucher down? I would say no. He made it quite clear that actually he wasn't going to be there uh, and Blucher fought independently. He wasn't waiting on Wellington's arrival. Um, and they, you know, very, two very different battles. Uh, Lingy, the uh, the Prussians faced uh, N Napoleon's might of his guns, really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what Napoleon does best of his kind of his hammering with his artillery and sending in columns, right? And, uh, and faced awful casualties. Whereas at Capturebra, it was very different, and it was an Allied um, strategic victory uh, at, at so much they could contested the crossroads at the end of the day uh, with all sorts of different elements of the alliance coming into play such as the Duke of Brunswick the Prince of Orange actually commanding the battle for the morning as well right well let's get into uh, myth number two in that the Prussians saved Wellington um, obviously this is a Prussian uh, point of view do you think I, I don't know like if the Prussians hadn't shown up would have you know and and Wellington was like engaged with Napoleon. Would he have retreated? Would he have stayed in it? Like, do you think the Prussians saved Wellington? Uh, yeah, this is the one that comes out all the time, uh, especially from the uh, the very pro uh, Napoleon camp, kind of trying to put down the Allied effort. No, I don't think the Prussians saved Wellington um, because it's Allied effort. Uh, and I view uh, Waterloo maybe a bit differently to some. This is not a slogging match between the Allies and the Prus and the French, sorry, and then the Prussians come in and save this. Mm -hmm. What this is, I view it as an Anglo-Allied army, you know, with the core British regiments in there, but so many multi nations in this line holding the ridge. They thought Wellington, especially thought that Napoleon would do something quite clever and right. flank round at Hal. Right. He had seventeen thousand troops there. It didn't happen. Wellington did not think Napoleon would just keep coming on and on, but it was great in many ways, hard pounding this gentleman, he said. Uh, but he came in and it's almost like he drew him into the perfect trap. He bled his army dry and then a classic swing trap came in and the Prussians started to roll up the army, drawing in more and more of the French into Plants Noir and then linking up across Papillot. And then just as that kind of came in as the Imperial Guard attack that they the two allied armies linked together and then rolled across the battlefield. It really was a very good trap if it was designed that way. And I think in many ways that is what Wellington intended. But the view that the Prussians saved Wellington, sorry, it's probably because the Prussians were delayed in their march. So it left Wellington in limbo and he was critical. If it had happened earlier in the day, we would have just said fantastic attack, you know, hold, block, attack. Right. And I think when uh, Blucher and Wellington met up later in the evening, uh, I think at La Belle Alliance, um, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't angry at each other. They just said, what an affair. And they shook each other's hand, you know. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things it was. I mean, the Belle Alliance was what they thought they could name the battle. And it's the perfect name uh, for it was an allied victory. Uh, but the Prussians were sadly delayed. Uh, and that's not me trying to blame them. But mm -hmm. that's where I think it's kind of exaggerated that the Prussians saved 
actually, if they'd been much later, it would have been Wellington's Allied army losing. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, if they turned up any earlier, we would have just seen a clearer, cleaner victory. Mm-hmm. And it was this moment of what we call the crisis, which is normally about 6 p.m., when La Haysant, uh falls, mm. that Wellington's line starts to look quite so uh, perilous. Indeed. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast on Spotify, and everywhere else, podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Let's move on to number three. Um, Mm. I think this is an interesting one. Napoleon would have kept his throne if he had won at Waterloo. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't think so. I think the odds were stacked against him. I mean, he had two hundred, maybe three hundred thousand in his army, going up against all of Europe with eight hundred, nine hundred thousand. Like the Russians and Austrians were still mobilizing. So yeah. I, I, I don't know your opinion. I don't think so, though. I was. I'm interested you hear that. That I don't think he would have either. Um, I think the the size of the forces, the Austrians are almost in the theatre of war uh, and they've got a very sizable force. And the the Russians have got about as far as the Rhine so in Germany. You know, let's remember they take part in the victory campaigns in Occupy Paris. So they're, they are on their way and they've marched a long way. Uh, you've got other forces that want to be part of this uh fights, especially the Portuguese, they really want to get involved. Mm-hmm. Um, the Spanish are mobilising, the Swedish are mobilising, and Britain is bringing up a lot of reinforcements because we've just finished kind of the War of 1812, even right. 1815. Right. So if uh, if Waterloo had been a defeat, if the Prussians had been delayed further, or Wav had been won, and Wellington had been defeated, Blue had been defeated, I think we would have seen a Allied uh, reorganisation on the coast somewhere, Mm-hmm. somewhere near Calais. Uh, we would have seen the Prussians fall back east and then uh, reform as best they could with reserves. You would have seen the Austrians come in, then you would have seen the Russians come in, and then you would have seen the British uh, reinforce, which would have been a much smaller force. Yeah, Those linking in, I think even diplomatically, uh, would have been a massive press- a pressure. But I think there would have been another battle probably about a month later that would have been bigger. Yeah, I think his only hope was to somehow split the alliance apart by you know, defeating a certain country's armies one at a time, you know, in detail, like he always had been. But I think at, at this juncture, they were all united in effort in against Napoleon. Yeah, and it's ironic uh, because um, when they were in Vienna at the Congress, uh, they were very close to war, arguing over some of the territories. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could have gone south very quickly. But Napoleon's return uh, united the old kind of allies back together. Uh, yeah. They had- they had no one else to fight. Um, so actually, they were fight, going to close to fighting each other. But Napoleon actually concreted their friendships again. Um, I, I think it was inevitable. Honestly, I'll go out on a limbo and say that I think Napoleon never stood a chance of victory. I think yeah. the allies together. I, I would love to conjecture what Napoleon was trying to do when he came back. If he wanted another chance of glory. I've heard theories that maybe he was trying to die even in battle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, solidify his uh, his myth and legend there himself by dying in battle kind of a kind of a, like a valkyrie going to valhalla but yeah yeah mm. yeah i mean he had a glorious hundred days it probably was nice for him to be back in paris for even just a little bit to taste that glory again but uh yeah yeah i think he would have lost as well even if he won at waterloo yeah um moving on uh number four you know you know my favorite marshal is marshal ney <laughs> and for whatever reason and if it's bonapartist or whoever say he did a poor job at Waterloo. I disagree, but I'm going to let you talk on it first. That's interesting. Okay, so I, I was going to blame the Bowdoin Partists as well um, yeah. that saying that Ney did a, a poor job, uh, and that's not just because the Bowdoin Partists have a lot to answer for sometimes, <laughs> uh, but they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's very unfair to blame Ney for um, Napoleon's defeat. Mm-hmm. Napoleon was the commander, and mm-hmm. he, he lost. Uh, so any delegation there really is on him. 
but Ney, I don't think, did a poor job. So Ney was tasked at Capture Bra and came very close to victory. This is yep. even just that's, just, that's just, I'm just looking at this campaign, never mind, you know, his fantastic cap career beforehand. Correct. Because um, that's, that's kind of like the prequel. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ney does actually quite a good job at Capture Bra, given uh, he has um, some very confusing orders at times. Mm-hmm. What, he does have a very long breakfast, still can't understand that, <laughs> um, and should have, should have acted earlier. But right. I don't think that would have changed the outcome of the battle. Per se, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but a Waterloo. So the he's given far too much criticism for the cavalry uh, attack. Actually, yeah. So he's he's normally criticised. Um, you've probably heard this that I, he he came forward and he didn't have um, infantry or artillery. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did it, bring them forwards. Not in the right numbers, but he did bring them forwards. Right, and he thought the British were retreating, so that's what you do. You send cavalry. Yeah. And the and it's it's documented that the, the heavy casualties that the squares um, had was because of the horse artillery that came up and fired against them. Yeah. The tracks. Yeah. So it was all on warfare. The infantry kind of couldn't get into the action because of the mass ranks of the cavalry. Yeah. Uh, but they were there. Uh, so I would say that that actually, you know, that, that was more that the Allied squares, you know, it was both Dutch, Germans, Belgians, uh, as well as British there. Uh, but we, we always think of the red coats. Um, they held incredibly well in the face of pressure. If one or two of those squares had gone, it would have probably been, you know, hurt. Yeah. And uh, they they'd gone down to the kind of rally huddle size. Some of them. They really did suffer huge casualties, largely from the artillery. Yeah. Then he was tasked with capturing La Haisant, yep. which had been attacked with a, and he achieved that. Yep. Uh, La Haisant fell about, as I said, about 6 p.m. Yep. Uh, the relieving columns of the King's German Legion, uh, famously sent down by uh, the Prince of Orange, uh, they were then wiped out, and the 95th Rifles pushed out the sand pit, uh, which is like the supporting position, yep. just up the road. So uh, that that was probably the most critical moment uh, for, for Wellington. He's been under huge pressure. He's received those cavalry charges, which uh, disorganised his troops and caused a high level, high level of casualties, and then La Haye So, uh, yeah, Ney, Ney, I thought, did quite quite well overall. I, uh, I, I'm yeah. going to go a step further. I'm going to say go he ahead. was winning the battle. You know, he Ooh. captured La Haye Saint, like you said. He was inflicting mass casualties in the ranks with his uh, horse artillery. He even called up extra troops and Napoleon kind of indignantly said, you know, what do you want me to do? Make them. And he had the Imperial guard standing mm. there at the time. So, you know, he also repelled a cavalry charge. Was it the, the Scott Grays that got pushed out? I mean, he, he did his yeah, job. Yeah. The Union Brigade. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I counter, I think he was about to win. And if Napoleon hadn't hamstrung him with, you know, uh, I can't release the guard yet. I think he might've done it. That's yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting one. I think that probably, uh, yeah. I think that, I think I think probably he was doing a very good job, uh, and you know he was leading very much from the front, a uh, very different style, yep. and uh, he's becoming a bit of a scapegoat uh, in this. I agree. I agree, and uh, that leads me into number five mm. in terms of scapegoats. Uh, this is probably the most famous one of all the Waterloo miss and bonapartists and all that and that grushi should have marched to the sound of the cannons instead of engaging with the prussians of water your thoughts on that one well his officers were to march to war uh and in my understanding of it he was given a, a very confusing orders which if you read it literally was kind of go to go, march east but then they were confusing the the left and the right uh, flanks of the river mm. so he was doing as he was ordered, though he was obviously a marshal was meant to use his initiative. Napoleon was very much in command of that campaign mm-hmm. and he was following his orders. And actually his orders to fight and hold around Wav, uh, you know, we just think of them blocking and moving. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's really hard fighting in the, uh, the city, uh, especially around the, uh, the bridge of the town. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, he was following his orders and did as he needed to. And actually, by the time he was involved in that, there wasn't really that much time to kind of disinvengle himself and get back to Mont Saint Jean to Waterloo. Right. What do, you, what do you kind of think on this one? Yeah, and I I, I read an article um, that actually the day before he had seen Ney get admonished for not following his orders at Quatre Bras, and so he was uh, probably in the back of his mind thinking, well, I better follow my orders to the letter and d- not deviate from what Napoleon tells me. 
So I'll just stay. I'll stay here while I hear the cannons. And I know Van Dam and Gerard are yelling at me to go back there, but I'm just going to follow my orders. And, and he won the battle and he got his core back to Paris intact. So I, I think he gets way, way, way too much blame on this one. Yeah, I, I think there's again, there's a case of scapegoating the marshals for Napoleon's failures. Mm. And um, it's interesting you mentioned about blaming on to Tanae that, that links us to one a bit later on that I'll, I've made a note of. But yeah, I think we've got to remember who, who's in command here and mm. Napoleon's style, uh, coupled with his health, uh, arguably, you know, I, I, I strongly believe the medical evidence is showing that Napoleon is suffering, you know, early symptoms of stomach cancer here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's unwell. He's got he's got piles and hemorrhoids. He's got massive crippling stomach pain. Right. Uh, and he's just generally unwell and quite right. lethargic. And I think he's kind of when you when somebody's in pain, you know, they become quite, you know, angry, grumpy, whatever the word you want to use. You can right. lash out at people. Right. You, if you've got a massive headache, stomach ache, you take you take that out on somebody. I think we see elements of that here that he's putting down uh, his marshals around him. Right. And I, 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 it's to me like in America, it's like blaming your assistant coaches instead of the head coach of a football team or a soccer team, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Who's in charge? Who's the boss? Right. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, and you can only you can only ever have one commander in a battle if it, if it goes well, if you want it to go well. Uh, we've seen a few examples where people try to do like kind of co-command and it doesn't really work to a you need one person ultimately making a decision. It's not a democracy. You don't, yeah. everyone doesn't have an equal vote. We yeah, have a military like, bank structure. Yeah, if, if Wellington had lost the battle, I don't think the blame would have gone on Hill or Barris or, or Pickner. <laughs> you know, no, that, would, that wouldn't have come for a second, would it? And we don't, we don't talk about those as the victors either, do we? We talk about Wellington. Correct. Uh, if Napoleon had won, we wouldn't have been going, ah, oh, Grouchy, you did a fantastic job and Ney was brilliant. We'd be going, you know, Napoleon this and Napoleon that. Yeah, so, mm. yeah, good point. Good point. Mm. Mm. Um, moving on, um, this one, I, 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 the Lahey Saint, we mentioned it earlier, and Hougamont, we should discuss as well. Mm. These were two buildings that were on the battlefield, and Wellington, you know, put garrisons within both of them, and one fell and one didn't. And I, I wanted to say, did Wellington wisely use and support Lahey Saint? I think he used it wisely. On the support side, though, I think it was just. Maybe it's just too many Frenchmen and they couldn't repel them wave after wave when they ran out of ammunition. Yeah, I mean, out of all, out of all the farms uh, that he used, the key ones being La Haysons and Hougamont, and, and Hougamont is such a special place to, to visit. Um, it really is one of my favorite places to visit anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, La Haysons is still in private hands and it very rarely opens up. And I've seen a few calls recently of people saying, oh, it should open. It's in private hands. It's in private hands, you know. Right, that's, right. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of plaques on the outside. So um, it's it's incredibly uh, similar in many ways. Uh, they both suffered multiple break-ins uh, and, and kind of pushing out. And both had uh, quite mixed forces, actually. It wasn't just the guards at Hougmont. Uh, there were allied forces there as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's a very special place for, for the guards to visit. Uh, Le Haysant being uh, defended by King's German Legion, who were veteran soldiers, uh, I would say, kind of near that elite status. Uh, they had a mix of muskets and rifles inside and it's support. So it's supported quite closely from the ridge. It's closer to the main allied positions uh, than Hougamont, which was mm. down the sunken lane. Mm -hmm. and, and had what we could say in the army is position in depth. So it's directly supported uh, by the 95th rifles in the sand pit. Mm -hmm. And what position in depth means that basically as you attack La Haysant, you can be fired directly upon by mm -hmm. the sand pits, uh, you know, 300 yards for a rifleman. Uh, La uh, kind of just a bit less than that. So if you're breaking down the doors, actually, if you turn to your right hand side, uh, you can see the sand pit and you can be shot up from there. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, it's well supported. The interesting one comes when they start to run out of ammunition. Right. And they're not given enough slash the um, correct supplies. Whereas at Hougamont, um, the driver breaks through with the supplies uh, for the Royal Corps transport. So they get that. Uh, could he have put more men in? Well, actually, you can't put that many men into tight buildings and expect them to be able to operate. They need freedom of movement. Uh, as as it, as the position fell, the mm -hmm. Prince of Orange famously sends forwards um, three battalions of uh, King's German Legion who don't see the French uh, cuirassiers and are cut down 
Uh, which mm. in turn we see lots of criticism of the Prince of Orange for that, but it's in a little bit of dead ground. It's quite close, so it's a, it's one for another time to debate, maybe. Right. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Lahison fell. It's a, it's a matter of fact. It was fiercely fought over. Right. I think it's one of these ones that was almost inevitable. Uh, if you rewind even as far as you know the night before, but they burnt their own gates because they didn't think they were going to stay there, uh, and it was a massive pressure on La Haysance because it's in the centre of the line as well. Yeah, yeah, and I want to just call it the bravery of the, the King's German Legion. Mm, and the soldiers, I mean, they probably knew it was a suicide mission. You know, like, we're just, we're all going to die here. Like, kind of like the Alamo, but they stayed at their posts. And, and there was an element of that. I mean, um, when the building was burning around them and they were still defending it with basically with like one shot in the barrel and bayonet. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, the King's German Legion, incredibly brave, uh, tough soldiers, originally Hanoverian, origins uh, fighting for the elector of Hanover, which happened to be King George. Mm-hmm. But as the French are coming in, they are uh, having shouts of no mercy and prisoners are executed and killed there. That's, that's German prisoners executed by the French. So mm-hmm. uh, it, it was not a nice, uh, clean fight. This is really brutal, really hand to hand going. And so yeah. it, they don't think they, they, in any way, did they let it fall. Uh, it, they fought up probably beyond where most, most men could have. Uh, only a few managed to escape, and even that, they actually ran through a burning building to escape. So, yeah, good shout to honor those men. Yeah, indeed. Uh, moving on, number seven. Uh, this is a big controversial one, too. Is mm-hmm. Napoleon should have started the attack earlier. Um, those of you who know your uh, Waterloo history, there was a big thunderstorm the uh, day before the water. Uh, the, you know, it was a huge storm. The, the fields were soaked. It was very muddy. So Napoleon, on the advice of his artillerymen, decided to postpone the start of the battle. Yeah, um, huge thunderstorms. Um, this is because of the uh, Indonesian uh, volcano that went off uh, that summer that uh, changed the atmosphere. So uh, the the volcano that might change the course of history. Mm-hmm. Um, the two ones here is one: it was waterlogged, and uh, what Napoleon could have done, you know, he possibly delayed the battle because he wanted to form up his grand battery. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of putting together, we think, somewhere between 60 to 90 guns. Uh, we can't quite tell, but it was certainly a, a sizable amount of guns together in one collective uh, near um, Derlon's Corps uh, and attacking there with a massive bombardment. So that was delayed, probably. The other one that isn't really given uh, enough attention is that actually the army was still strung out along the road from the day's march the day before. Mm -hmm. Uh, the night before so they weren't actually in position so the weather played a factor but actually there were still men kind of moving up the road you know this is really confusing there's you know not actually many torches being lit certainly we're hundreds of years before anything like night vision goggles and that kind of command and control (laughs) radios and and things that help you and mobile phones and you know whatsapp that we all use today Um, so they genuinely were struggling to move along that road so it reached a point that the french army was getting kind of snarled up and then we're just kind of camping out where they were, as they weren't actually far enough up. So Napoleon should have started some sort of attack earlier, probably, to start applying the pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wellington certainly thought he was going to. The army stood too at dawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, the bit going of how he could have done that without the main pressure of his army, that's an interesting one. Yeah, and, and the reason the artillerymen wanted to hold off is, you know, cannonballs generally cause more damage when they bounce mm. off the ground, and they kind of skip through. They skim like, like a cricket ball. Right, like a regiment, and just plow through like an entire body of soldiers. But due to the mud, they they were just being fired and like landing and not moving. They were just you know, bedding in the mud. And it's really and, clay soil there as well, just to be clear for anyone who hasn't visited. You know, if it starts to rain, it's it really claggy, solid, clunky soil. It's not just uh, wet. Ah, see, I'm glad you told us that because I've never been there. So I'm glad you have that uh, that that firsthand experience. <laughs> uh, but also, just you know, maneuvering troops is hard in wet, soggy mud. So if Napoleon's planning this intricate frontal assault, he needs freedom of freedom of movement for his uh, infantry. So I, I get why he waited, but you're right; he should have done either a probing or some sort of uh, skirmishing this uh, much earlier in the day. Yeah, and I, I am certainly not a general, and I'd hate to be an armchair general, uh, but I think he could have done something to start the action and start applying pressure. Um, mm. Yeah, like you say, like some sort of probing attack, a feint, you know, mm. arguably Hougamont was the first action at 10 o'clock. That could maybe could have been earlier uh, with different forces. So, yeah, it's 
it's certainly uh, one should he have done, but I think the big one there is actually kind of the myth is that it was just the mud. Uh, there was actually an element for the night before there as well. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, moving on, this one also, I, I hear a lot about this one. Uh, number eight is um, Napoleon should have employed Marshal Davout and Marshal Murat at Waterloo. Uh, famously, Davout was left back in Paris as Minister of War because it was really the only man Napoleon could trust in Paris. And Murat was turned away after his treachery in 1814. What do you think, would, th would this have made any difference to have these two? Probably. Um, but, I mean, Murat's going to be almost impossible because he's down in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, by this point, he's thrown his hat in uh, and gone into fighting. Uh, he's gone into fighting a quite... Uh, quite early, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he's basically lost by the time that Waterloo is coming about uh, and right. being executed for. So uh, it's it's really difficult for him to have actually had any effect at all, whether whether he wants him or not. Yeah, I've, I've read about this, and and I've read that Napoleon said if you know Murat was there, he might have broken one or two squares of English infantry, and that's all I needed. But I, I don't know if one man could have done that. I mean, as you know. <laughs> British infantry squares were notoriously impossible to break. Yeah, and I don't think that the the cavalry would have had a better effect because of the way they would have led, as opposed to Ney. You know, once they're actually away from the general, the, the orders are given, they're attacking the squares. Right. Uh, you're into regimental and subunit level fighting, maybe even brigade. But, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think it would have made that big a difference. Uh, Murat has uh, probably more faults than he does positives in many ways um, <laughs> you'll know he's he's quite an egotistical one but i don't yeah. think he could have been employed i don't yeah. think it was physically uh possible no i agree and um Davout's the interesting Davout, one. the iron marshal i'd be yeah. interested to hear actually please can you see what you think yeah yeah i mean if he, <laughs> was, if he was a commander instead of grushi of Wab, would he have returned probably would it made a difference probably not but uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if Davout would have made a huge difference. I still think Ney would have been put in charge of the main thrust at Waterloo. Um, yeah, well, do you think Davout would have replaced uh, Saul as chief of staff? Or... Yeah, maybe, and probably would have issued a lot clearer orders. Um, yeah, that's a good point. But he, again, even that, like, would that have turned the tide? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to know if one person uh, would make such a difference. Yeah, um, you know, there's the famous quotes um, there, isn't there? That um, Wellington thought that Napoleon was worth twenty thousand men on the field. Right. Um, sorry, forty thousand men on the field. Um, <laughs> and then what? Wellington's own men said they'd rather see Wellington than twenty thousand reinforcements. Yeah. Uh, but actually, you know, forty thousand or twenty thousand men would have made probably as much a difference once the, some of the action starts to take place. Um, I think Davu probably would have made a difference to the campaign if he'd been like a core commander. Mm. Uh, and the other one I would always, you know, put in is uh, Berthier and what happened to Berthier, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, a, as a very uh, competent chief of staff and yeah, not yeah. not being there for uh, for quite obvious reasons. Yeah, but again, it's, it, it, it harks back to football or, or soccer. Like, you know, you, you play with the players that are available. You don't lament the guys that are injured or, or not on the on the pitch, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I think my main one comes down to uh, my limited military experience. You know, a general visits you and says, oh, how are you all doing, guys and girls? Are you OK? And then as soon as you are back into your, your foxhole and stuff, you, you kind of forget about that. Um, it's about the guys around you, the, girl, the girls and guys that you're working with. Um, right. So actually, the grand strategy, who's actually on the horse puffing you on, uh, only has some very limited effects, you know, when there's a cannonball coming towards you, um, how much your is your leader really having an effect there? Right. Uh, it's about the grand strategy, isn't it? And actually the grand strategies were quite well laid out by both sides. Right. It was right. then kind of the, the later reactions of Napoleon and Wellington that kind of, um, you know, throughout history, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Napoleon had some very competent yeah. core uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, Delon and uh, uh, Kellerman was with the cavalry, and there was there were some good soldiers that Napoleon still had on his side. Yeah, he certainly had um, some very good and very experienced both commanders and troops. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that 
uh, you know, different generals weren't important. Uh, yeah. That's that's not the case of what I was trying to say. Um, no, no. But I was just kind of thinking. Um, but you know, there's there's some who reacted um, very well, and um, basically, I think the strategy was slightly flawed, uh, given the fact that the counter strategy, uh, Wellington's, and it was Wellington's strategy, not Luca's strategy, to hold the ridge and then come in. Um, but, and I say that just cl just clarify the other side because Wellington came up with the strategy and wrote to the Prussian headquarters, and that was enacted on the seventeenth of June when Blucher was actually injured. So it wasn't it was part of as much as I believe in the alliance. It wasn't uh, Blucher at that moment. Uh, he was incapacitated. He'd fallen off his horse and hurt himself three times. Right. Three times. I mean, brave man, um, <laughs> a tough man. But yeah. Um, yeah. Could, would would one man have made a difference? I mean, if anyone would have, it probably would have been um, Davu. Yeah. But, but then, you know, I think Berthier and I think a lot's got to be done for um, staff, staff officers uh, there. But the army Napoleon was given, it wasn't his most elite army, but it was actually probably better than his army in like 1813, 1814, when it's purely conscripts. So, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And you make a good point there that, you know, the, the Grand Army was somewhat rusty. You know, a lot of these guys hadn't worked in, with each other and Marshal Soult was new to the role. And, and you saw even at Ligny when, um, was it Derlans who was marching back and forth all day between Quatre Bras and Ligny? Like, you know, there was just a lot of miscommunication and poor orders going on in Napoleon's army at that time. Yeah. Uh, effectively, it comes down to what I, what I love about Waterloo is there's so many what ifs. If yeah. it hadn't rained, if Grouchy hadn't done this. If, yeah. yeah. And I think that's why Waterloo will continue to fascinate us. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let me move on to uh, number nine and 10 here. Um, number nine being Napoleon should have rallied his troops for another try the next day. Yeah. So uh, we kind of get to the end of the battle is the, um, the troops starting to flee. Now, Napoleon does want to carry on fighting, mm -hmm. uh, but he actually heads off at quite a speed. Uh, he has to move between his carriage on, onto his horse and his, as far as I'm aware, he actually almost gets captured by the Prussians and they, they get his carriage, they certainly get his sword, which ended up back at Apsley House. And the story used to go that a Prussian soldier grabbed his sword and uh, Napoleon unbuckled it, but I'm not sure how much uh, truth there was in that, <laughs> but um, uh, certainly made for a good story. Right. Um, so how able they were to to rally. Um, so the in the in the follow-up, it was agreed that the Allied army, the Anglo-Allied army, was exhausted, and they were going to kind of rest and then march on the next day. The Prussians carried on the pursuit. Mm. Uh, they did things like they mounted uh, drummers onto horses, so it sounded like the infantry were really close behind. Mm -hmm. uh, they also executed prisoners as well. The Prussians were very brutal in that. Mm -hmm. uh, there were rearguard actions by the French army, it's certainly at key bridges. I think it was almost impossible i think the the flight uh, about when was that about 7 30 8 p.m when the french army starts to break uh, yeah. it becomes a bit of a torrent should he have done yes he probably should have done um, yeah and I, i've read that he, he did try he tried to rally him on a few bridges but i think once the invincible imperial guard broke i think that just scared the wits out of the french army and they said you know enough's enough we're, we're just running all the way back to paris we're, we're yeah. done yeah, I mean, that's another myth, isn't it, that the Imperial Guard fought was the last man. They didn't. Yeah. Um, some of them surrendered and some of them fled and some of them fought. Um, yeah. And seeing that and seeing, you know, a lot of casualties on both sides and mm -hmm. a long day's fighting. And, you know, I think especially the troops there probably would have been under the impression that actually fighting with Napoleon, they would have been uh, unbeatable, mm -hmm. uh, that Napoleon was unbeatable. This was a big rallying cry. So actually, I think they even they thought, oh, it's a really tough day, but right. eventually we're going to win. And then right. that myth that they kind of thought that there was a rumour, wasn't it, that Grouchy had arrived and was attacking them on the eastern flank, and then they realised it was the Prussians, and yeah. uh, then they realised that the, the numbers were coming against them and the fighting in the, the town of Plants Noir was awful. Yeah. And I, th I think I think morale was on the down, and actually once you start to get that kind of routing uh, fever as such, that people who've people wanted to run. So the fact that there was any rear guard action was definitely down to those more junior commanders who were able to do that. Uh, Napoleon, yeah, he should have rallied his troops. I don't think he was able to. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, everyone knows that I'm not Napoleon's biggest fan. I don't, I don't think actually that's against him. I don't think he was actually able to have that effect. Yep, I agree. Number 10, it was the last battle of the Napoleonic Wars. Hmm. 
Mm, no, I... <laughs> no I, but I think people just, it, it is the last huge battle, I will say that, but it's not the last battle. It's not the last battle. I mean, uh, most immediately you've got, um, there's a campaign towards Paris. Mm. Uh, it actually goes on and into uh, quite late July. Mm. And uh, that campaign goes on. Uh, Napoleon himself wanted to uh, carry on the, the campaign for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's not possible. But they they fight into uh, to July and famously uh, Saint Denis suburb of Paris, uh, and so that carries on. That both the Prussians and the British end up uh, down there. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, the fighting doesn't finish on the eighteenth of June. It does carry on for a good like three weeks uh, there. And you know there's there are there's the wider conflict as well. I'm sure you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, no, there's, and there's some good rear guard actions, you know, uh, General Exelmans uh, gives the Prussians a bloody nose, uh, Davu still has a large army of National Guard that he can uh, call on, but yeah, I think um, for all intents and purposes, it was the end of the Napoleonic Wars, even though there was a few skirmishes on some of the frontiers as well, I know uh, mm. General Rapp pushed back uh, some Austrians, uh, Suchet, does, yeah. so yeah, there was other stuff going on. There was, and there was, there was multiple forts of the French that held out for quite a while. Uh, but it, it's it's not it's not the end actually. The the Paris campaign doesn't receive um, uh, much much highlights. But you know the writing's on the wall. Napoleon heads back to Paris and says that he uh, wants to carry on fighting. And effectively, his own Parliament said, "No, that's that's not really what's going to happen now." I'm afraid. Right. Uh, do you want to consider leaving, or do you want to consider surrendering? <laughs> Those are your two options. Right. Well, let's jump. We have two bonus myths. You guys thought we were done. We have two more for you. Um, the First bonus myth is uh, Napoleon surrendered that day at Waterloo. Yes, thank you, Ben and Beyond from ABBA. Uh, <laughs> I would I refrain from singing it, but he says, whoa, whoa, whoa Napoleon did surrender there. Um, I think you've won, I've lost the war. Uh, right. Quote, um, right. you know, he doesn't. Uh, he he makes, it, uh, makes it to Paris, as I said, uh, and he makes it then on to the Billy Ruffian, as, it, as we call it, uh, HMS uh, Bella Ruffian. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is on the coast in July. And so this is actually mid to late July. And by all intents and purposes, we believe that Napoleon was trying to flee to America. Uh, it's quite mm. a big French uh, colony out in America. Mm. And uh, he's blockaded in by uh, HMS Bellarafian. And mm. uh, he then actually goes onto, onto deck and surrenders to uh, Captain Maitland, I think a distant relative of General Maitland, mm-hmm. uh, but not not a, a close relative, but, um, you know, Maitland, they won't stand, fame of the guards, and uh, he surrenders to, to him, so actually a, a naval captain, which is equivalent to an army colonel, so right. not not a senior officer, actually, right. not, not, not a very high officer, and uh, surrenders there on just on board the, uh, the Royal Navy's deck. Yeah, yeah, you do wonder, though, if he would have just made a break for it, would he have made it to America, and if so... If, if he made it, what would he have done there? Would he have become yeah. a quiet private citizen or would he would cause trouble in America too? You don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to know as well because there was the colony of, uh, was it Vines and Olives, uh, <laughs> which a lot of French generals went out to and they, they tried to farm. Uh, there is actually a fiction series of Napoleon in America, which is highly recommended. I know very well researched. So mm-hmm. um, that's what I sh- really do want to pick up one day because I know uh, the author does a lot of good research. So wrong of me to have not picked up the book yet yeah no that is, i've seen that as well um mm-hmm. and then my 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 added bonus question um mm-hmm. and on. this is highly debatable i don't want anyone <laughs> really angry at me but waterloo is the greatest song by abba swedish <laughs> I, I thought i thought a super trooper no no no, no. I, I i think it's uh take a chance maybe fernando uh mama mia but some people are very adamant that waterloo is their greatest hit what is your thought <laughs> do you know what it's it's probably one of the earliest um military history songs in, in pop culture <laughs> it, it, it could well be um they're one of the greatest it's certainly one of the most famous certainly one of the most hummed ones yeah and uh when i briefly dabbled with reenactment uh we had a very uh, down to earth guy who played uh, Napoleon in Britain, and yes, we did sing uh, Waterloo to him when he <laughs> parades past. <laughs> it is a very catchy song, I will say. It's really catchy, isn't it? It's um, yeah, it's a real uh, earworm. It gets stuck, and I'm just really struggling not to hum it right now because yeah. I'm certainly not going to sing. Indeed, no, I, uh, I, I, I just want to get that one in there. But um, <laughs> that was that was very informative. I think we covered a lot of the myths that are out there and legends. Um, 
I, I, it is an intriguing battle. You know, I know it has, it has more research than all the other ones. Frankly, I think the battle of Leipzig is more pivotal than Waterloo, mm. but I know Waterloo gets all the attention. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've given this a lot of debate with, um, online and, and with, with friends and colleagues. And, you know, I know, um, Zach White's done a, a bit on it. That it wasn't that important. And to, to an element, I agree, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the be or end or I think we've said earlier, you know, there would have been other battles that would have defeated Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it's such an important landmark event in history. Mm-hmm. Um, not only did so many men die, but it, it helped write history. And all of these what ifs and myths uh, keep people coming back time and time again. Just to wrap up here, since you're doing the tour tomorrow, how, how should one visit the battlefield? Is it a several day thing? Should you get a hotel in Brussels? Like, mm. well, what's How do you usually recommend people visit the battlefield? Yeah, I'd definitely say two days. Okay. Um, two days minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, one for one day. Uh, so the summary is: if you have one day, you can basically go and see the main uh, museum. Mm-hmm. You can walk up the lion's mounds. You can. Uh, they normally have a, like reenactors there, fire a cannon, and do a quick demonstration. And then you probably get as far as uh, Hougoumont on one of the tickets, and you might get to either Napoleon or Wellington's headquarters. But that's kind of your day out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that's probably day one. Day two. Park up back at the museum, get on your hiking boots Mm -hmm. and walk it. It's achievable, but there are no toilet breaks. Um, (laughs) It's a walk in a day. And that's what I'm going to do on the 18th of June. Uh, It's what I love taking groups out there uh, to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. There's a a real uh, clockwise uh, loop that you can follow. I really need to write it up as a pamphlet or something. Um, but it's it's all achievable. It's all on tracks. Uh, the only thing I say is, you know, it's lots of cobbles and dusty roads and some mm-hmm. uh, share on stuff. So you do want, um, and then there's tarmac. You really do want a good pair of boots and a bottle of water with you and uh, good bladder control. But, <laughs> um, it's it's really worth doing in a day. If I took my partially sighted father there, who's you know pushing on his late sixties, and he mm-hmm. did it in um, he did it at thirty degrees in August, uh, then most people should be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's the best way to feel connected with the battle. It's the best way to appreciate the ground. And there's a lot of memorials to to units as you go around. Mm-hmm. So you can pay uh, homage and respects to both individual units, but also stands, you know, where such important history took place. Right, right. No, it's, I've never been, so I appreciate you sharing mm-hmm. that with me. And I, I'd really like to see it sometime soon. So. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love to take you or show you there if I could. Yeah. Yeah. One day we'll make that happen. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, thank you, my friend, as always, for this great episode as again. And um, yeah, I hope my listeners enjoyed it.